very weak My faithfulness fails My courage will flee But you are my rock My shelter and shame When I'm burdened down You'll carry the I will cast my cares on you. I will rest within your arms, knowing I am safe from harm. I will cast my cares on you. I'm overwhelmed and I cannot stand you hear every cry and you lift my head I'm desperate for grace and mercy anew I must have your strength must have you so I will cast my cares on you yes I will cast my cares on you I will rest within your arms knowing I am safe from harm I will cast my cares on you, so I will cast my cares on you, yes I will cast my cares on you, oh, I will Our call to worship comes from Isaiah, chapter 25, verse 1. And this verse really demonstrates the proper response to God's perfect faithfulness. So please follow along as I read Isaiah 25, verse 1. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name. For you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. Let's pray. Father, we come to you through the name of your son and our mediator, Jesus. We thank you for this season, for it serves as a reminder of your faithfulness. You said you would send one who would be pierced through for our transgressions and crushed for our inequities. And by his scourging, we are healed. These things happened just as you said they would through your prophet Isaiah. Isaiah witnessed your faithfulness and had much to be thankful for in his day. We have witnessed even more. Let us praise you for your faithfulness now. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and begin our time of singing. Let's lift our voices together in joy and thankfulness to our Lord as we echo even some of the songs.
sung by the angels over 2,000 years ago. Here we go. Angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing o'er the plains In the mountains in reply Echoing their joy astray
this Jesus, he's a hope for all mankind. Yes, he has come for us, the Messiah, born to give us life. He was born to give us life. Amen. Please be seated. Please turn to Luke chapter 2 for our scripture reading this morning. I will read verses 1 through 14. Last week we saw the birth of the forerunner. This week we will see the birth of the Savior. So please follow along as I read the word of God. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Let's pray. Father, we come before you again through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the untainted blood that purchased our forgiveness. Forgive us for when we're indifferent and apathetic to these realities, for they are realities. The reality of the Savior's birth caused an army of angels to praise you. May that reality cause us to praise you as well. Amen. Please stand again. Adore the King who came to 
our world to save us, born to heal our prideful race, crown us with forgiveness, follow, fall before the one who in mercy left his throne, Christ the Lord, God's only Son, his glories now. the humble king Here we go come adore come adore come adore the king bow before come adore the It came upon the midnight clear That glorious song of old From angels bending near the earth To touch their hearts of gold Peace on The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. Yet with the woes of sin and strife, the world has suffered Beneath the angel refrain have rolled two thousand years of wrong, and man in war with God hears not the love song with which they bring. Oh, hush the noise.
Father, we praise you for the opportunity and the means to celebrate the birth of Christ and what he came to do for us that we could never do. And Lord, as this song continues to point towards it, help that to not only renew our love for Christ as we contemplate that today and to stir our hearts to live more abundantly for him, to stir one another up for love and good works, but also to look forward to the fact that we are not finished that he is coming again to take us home to be with him forever. Lord, that all of us here one day who belong to you will sin our last sin and spend eternity in glory with you. Father, help us to respond in gratitude, but also to have our hearts stirred for those who do not know you, to call them to you, to call them to repent, even this very day. Bless this time uh, as your word is open and preached to us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning. We're in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to look at Luke 2, verses 22 through 35. We're pushing pause on our uh, series in Romans for just the Christmas season, and as we look at some texts that are important to us, and some that might even escape our notice from time to time, uh, this one reminds me of of something that uh, I felt like happened to me frequently growing up in, in school, where... My mind was not always in the classroom, rarely in fact, was it ever in the classroom. It was, it was outside, it was somewhere else, it was at recess, it was at PE, and, and going to do something else. And, and, and I remember there would be times where at the end of the class, you think things are almost over, you're watching the clock, and you think, I'm about to be released, I'm about to go, and this is it, and I'm about to get my freedom. And then the teacher says, but before you go, and then they pull down another chart or something on the board and they say, there's, there's a few questions I want you to answer. And then after you answer these, then you can go. Or maybe it's like a, a business meeting where you know, you're in somebody's office just hanging out and you just drop in just to say hello, but you've got another appointment to get to. And they say, while I've got you, and then three hours later, right? While I've got you, let me ask you a couple of questions. While I've got you, let, let me put something else in front of you. And that's kind of what takes place here. That uh, b- before we're dismissed, there's some questions that need to be answered. There's some things that, that need to be settled for us. Before you leave here today, every single one of you need to, to grapple with these questions. You need to understand what is being said here and, and how the scripture answers them. Before you're dismissed, these are things that each of us needs to think about. Uh, here in Luke 2, verses 22 through 35, it's a, it's a little vignette of, of a character that we don't usually associate with Christmas. He doesn't make it into most of the children's stories that recount the biblical narrative. And uh, when we talk about Christmas, we don't remember this. And because it happened uh, some days later, after over a month later after Christ was born, but it's associated and caught up with the, the events of the birth of Christ. And, and this character enters the scene. We've never seen him before. He comes on the scene for just a, a few verses, says just a couple of lines, and then he departs, and we never see him again. And that's all by God's design, because as he comes in, as he steps into your office, as he, as he addresses some things that are going on, he says them, and they are right on the front of our, need to be right on the front of our thinking, right at the very forefront of our minds. And then he goes, and though he may have departed, his questions seem to linger, and his statements seem to hang there in the air, and things that we all need to consider. Before you're dismissed, there's a a few questions I want us to to think about this morning, and these all come from this wonderful scene, this amazing scene where Uh, A young Mary and Joseph uh, with a new baby in arms named Jesus come to Jerusalem to the temple and they meet this man named Simeon. And uh, as we walk through this text, I want to ask a few of these questions. And the first one is this. It's in verses 22 through 27. Am I comforted? Uh, the Heidelberg Catechism asks, us, asks the question, well, what is the only source of comfort in this life, in life and in death? And, and anything short of, anything beyond, or anything that comes short of Christ, it will not bring comfort. What is your only comfort in life and death? Is it your job? Is it the security that comes with that? Is it a home? Is it, it, is it uh, a certain relationship? What brings me comfort? 
Or maybe to the point, who brings me comfort? Look down at your Bibles, Luke 2, and we begin there, verse 22. And then we, here's where the narrative picks up. And when the days for their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, what's going on here? If you look back at verse 21, uh, there's, a, there's a compression of time that takes place. In verse 21, it's the eighth day after Jesus was born and Jesus is circumcised. And now this fast forwards uh, after eight days, 33 more days of the purification that is given in the Old Testament. And so we're now on day 40 or 41 and Jesus is a, about a 40 day old infant in arms. And, and, and so the purification that has taken place is according to God's word. And it is for Mary to, to go through through the, uh, the mechanism that God has given so that God's people can express their faith in him and so their sins can be covered. And those days were completed. And so after that, and we'll see more about that here in a moment, they bring Jesus up to Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem. It's on a mountain to present Jesus to the Lord. Um, what's not given to us here in the fine print of verse 22 is that this would not be a, an easy trek. Uh, they did not have cars. And in fact, we're going to see a little bit later on that Mary and Joseph probably had very little means monetarily. And, and so in all likelihood, they, they probably walked. Um, now, the average walk of, of an American that takes normal walks, not the person who says, I haven't walked in a year and I'm going to start today. Uh, those are outliers because you walk 10 miles and then you don't do it again. Uh, but the average walk is anywhere from two to three miles uh, for the average person. This was a six mile journey one way. Uh, and, and so they're, they're leaving Nazareth, they go to Jerusalem, and, and there is uh, the, the temple and all of its magnificence, and there are people in and out, and, and all the things that are going on there, and they're likely tired and covered in dust. They're not quite sure all that's happening. Uh, if you go back uh, many months, even to the, the time when Mary was first told and Joseph were first told, the, the news has been shocking. The news has been unreal. It's unlike anything else that has ever happened in the world. And they've been sitting on this news, only able to share that with just a few select people and uh, family members of what has happened and what has taken place. And, and here comes some confirmation of that from the Lord. Now remember, this is actually why Luke has written this gospel account. Luke wrote two volumes. He wrote Luke, and he also wrote Acts. One of the ways we know that is because they both start uh, the same way. They're both written to the same guy, and Luke is writing them to his friend so that he will know the exact things that happened, so that he will be bolstered in his faith. So this is what's taking place there in verse 22. And then in verse 23, the reason why they go up for these days of purification or after that, it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So these days of purification that have been referenced and, and now quoted here in verse 23 is from Exodus chapter 13. Now that is the passage that he is looking to. He'll look to another passage here in a moment. But in Exodus 13... Uh, it was remembered that the firstborn son, not because he's special or just because he happens to be first, but because of what God did for Israel in the Exodus and the Passover and how God saved his people. And, and the only way that a firstborn son was not killed by the death angel was that God's blood that he provided for them through the sacrificial lamb was put on the doorpost of their homes and the death angel passed over them and they were saved by the blood that God himself had provided in the sacrifice. And so something like that is going on here as, as Luke calls to mind this and what they were going through uh, in the ritual of the law, that this was not just a ritual to go through. This was not just a practice to, uh, to, to, to go through the motions of worship, but this was a, a, a way of showing allegiance to the Lord. It was a way of showing their devotion to God. As they come there in verse 23 with their firstborn in arms, they would call to mind the words of Exodus 13 when later on when your firstborn son would look back on that and ask, why are we doing this? Exodus 13 says, you're to tell your son it's because of what the Lord did. 
Now, what does that mean? Why does she need purification? Why, why does the child need to be dedicated to the Lord? Because it was also a, a, a recognizing the, of the fact that humanity is born in sin. That humanity is born in sin and that sin is passed on from one parent to the, uh, to the child, from both parents to the children. It goes that way all the way back to Adam and Eve. It is endemic to humanity. It is a part of who we are. It's in our DNA. That sin is not passed down through blood, it's passed down through nature. And so everyone who has human parents, which is everyone, is full of a sin nature. And, and what's being described there in Exodus 13 is the fact that every believer who is in the Lord needs to go and, and express allegiance to the Lord and the fact that God will save them and has saved them by the blood This accomplished a couple of things. One in verse 23, it, it, it said that this child and all that we are belongs to the Lord. But there was a second aspect of this that we see in verse 24. And it was also to offer a sacrifice according to what had been said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or, or two young pigeons. Here it's not only the, the dedication of verse 23, but here in verse 24, it is the sacrifice that was needed. Verse 24 looks back to Leviticus chapter 12, verse 8. Now, I, I know that uh, we all have in mind when we think of two turtle doves, that, that toddler drinking song, um, uh, where you get down to two and it just keeps repeating and repeating again and again, and, and parents learn to hate that song at a certain place. But, but that's not just something that's pulled out of, uh, out of tradition. That's actually something that's right there in Leviticus and then repeated here in verse 24. And it actually tells us something. It tells us something about Mary and Joseph and that they had a lowly status. They did not have great means monetarily. They, they did not come from uh, the regal side of the tracks. They were not uh, prince, prince and princesses. They were not kings and queens. And yet what God in his own way is showing is that nevertheless they were royalty. Uh, they were royalty because they would bear not just a king, they would bear the king. And, and he would come forth from them and he would be raised in their home. And this lowly couple, this young couple with all the, the, the confusing ideas and all the questions that were around them and even in their own hearts, God is doing something amazing through them. Now, how do we know that they're uh, of lowly status and monetarily poor? Well, it's because of the sacrifice that is given there. In Leviticus 12, there's three provisions for sacrifices. The first is, is that a lamb would be sacrificed uh, when a firstborn son is, is dedicated in the temple. Uh, but if, if someone doesn't have the means to do that, then they can bring a, a, a cheaper sacrifice, not cheaper in quality, but cheaper in its, in its monetary value and being able to purchase it. And that would be two turtle doves or two young pigeons. But this also tells us that they were not at the very bottom rung of the social status because there was yet a third uh, provision that was made in the law and it was actually just a, a small percentage of grain or flour that would be given for someone who had really nothing. Uh, and so there's somewhere there in the middle, middle to, to lower class and state, nothing to their names, not very much in belongings and all of those things. And this is their sacrifice that they bring to come and, and, and show their allegiance to what God has done and to confess their sins and, and to say yet again, we are under the blood of the Lamb. And then in verse 25, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. So another character comes into the scene here. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 25 is really the centerpiece of this whole passage. There is a lot happening uh, in verse 25, but there's this man who is there, and, and I can't be dogmatic about this, but I think he is probably uh, fulfilling a priestly function. He's working in that occupation as uh, part of the, the temple complex there, and because of things that will take place here very soon in our text. But what's known to us is, is not what we might uh, have... Some of the things we might have uh, thought were known to us are actually not made known to us in the text. We don't really know his age. Uh, we don't know some of the details of his life. We don't know uh, his day-to-day -day occupation or some of the things that he was involved in. We don't know anything about his family. All we know is what the Lord wants us to know through the pen of Luke, and that is his name is Simeon. It's a common name. 
There's nothing special about that name. It was very common at the time. In fact, we know the most famous Simeon is Simon Peter. Simon's name is actually Simeon. In fact, he prefers to be called that. That's how he addresses himself the only time in his epistles in 1 and 2 Peter. Uh, that's how James uh, addresses him in Acts chapter 15 as Simeon. But this is not that Simeon. This is another one. And, and it might be that he is an old man. But what we need to know about him is told to us there in the middle of verse 25. This man was righteous and devout. He is right before God. He is devoted of heart. That is very important because as will become, become a theme in the ministry of Christ, uh, that there are many, and there was a whole class of people that wore their righteousness on their sleeve. Uh, they were called the Pharisees. And the majority of disciples in Israel, not Christian disciples, but disciples of Israel, they were made according to the Pharisees. They were followers of the Pharisees. Those were the heroes of Israel's faith at that time. And Jesus said something astonishing in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. He said that your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. It must go beyond that of the scribes and Pharisees. Now that sounds impossible. Because these guys, these characters, were able to, to tithe out cumin. I don't know if you've ever cooked with that or messed with that. And they were able to tithe out uh, salts and, and all the different spices and the things that would be brought as sacrifices. And, and they could say, and they could look at a, a tiny grain and see if someone had tithed enough or not tithed enough based on the amount of grain. They were very good at, at threading those needles. They were very good at, at, at parsing out little portions of the law and actually missing the whole thing. And what that amounted to is that they wore their righteousness outwardly. It was an external righteousness entirely. It was not a righteousness of the heart. They were not right with God. They did not belong to the Lord. They thought they did. They had a righteousness that was merely external. And Jesus says, your righteousness, to be right with God, must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. It must get beyond just a, an external shell. It must be a, a righteousness that is born of the heart that is only conferred to us by what Christ himself could do. We are not made righteous in the sense of any of our own works. We are, we are not, uh, God does not fan a righteous flame or spark that is naturally in us. There is no righteousness. There's no one righteous. No, not one. But as we've been seeing in, in our study of Romans, righteousness is conferred. It is granted. It is given. It is declared in the sense that we are seen filthy works and all through the righteousness of Christ. That is the only kind of righteousness that is enough before the Lord. And, and this brother, this Simeon, he is looking forward to the promises of God being fulfilled. And he is trusting the Lord. And, and so just like Abraham before him, he is believing God and it is credit to him as righteousness. But not only that, you see there he is devout. This is how we know his righteousness is different than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. There is a devotion of heart. Uh, there, there is a heart that belongs to the Lord. He is trusting in the promises. That is what that, de that word means, devout. His heart is set on God, even at the inner person, what no one else sees. Luke tells us what's most important about this, this man. He's right before God, and his heart is sincere in his worship of the Lord. What has he been looking forward to? In verse 25, notice this at the end of verse 25. He has been looking for the consolation of Israel. That word consolation, it's a word that means comfort. He, he's been looking for the hope of Israel, that Israel would be comforted, that Israel would be helped, that we would be consoled. Israel would be consoled in her sins and the disparities of, of all of her actions. You think back through the history of Israel up to that point. It had just been a, a, a cyclical time of of faithfulness and unrighteousness, of faithfully walking with the Lord and then walking away from the Lord, of, of purity and then exile because of sin. And it's just this endless cycle where we're dominated by other nations and then we're carried off in slavery and then brought back and then carried off again. And it's just this, this endless time that seems to be without hope. And all along that, that same trail of, of history is also this thread of redemption that says that God is going to send his Messiah. God is going to bring hope. God is going to send himself in the form of a suffering servant who will lay down his life for the sins of the people. Simeon believed that. 
Simeon believed Isaiah's words when he reads the promises of the prophets, the promises of Moses, that one would arise who would be greater than the prophet, even Moses himself. That one would arise, there would be a, a son from the lineage of the royal throne of David that would be better than David. Promise after promise after promise. Up to that point, no fulfillment from Simeon's vantage point. But now the, the story has changed. And he has been looking for the consolation of Israel, the comfort of Israel. Isaiah 25, verse 9. Behold, this is our God for when we, for whom we have waited that he might save us. Isaiah says that when the Messiah appears, God's people will rally to him. Now in Isaiah 25, he's looking to the ultimate arrival of the kingdom of the Messiah. What Simeon didn't understand fully is that that day has dawned in the face of Christ and in the person and work of him who he holds in his arms. He tells us something else significant about Simeon at the end of verse 25. The Holy Spirit was upon him. The Holy Spirit was upon him. Um, there's, there's a number of differences. You've probably uh, seen this between the Old and the New Testament. Not just the words old and new, but, but how, how they unfold, how the story unfolds, how the, the thread of redemptive history is met, how it's answered, and all those things. And one of the key differences is not that the Holy Spirit changes, He doesn't change, but the, the work of the Holy Spirit changes, that He does something new when we get to the new covenant. In fact, in the Old Testament, the God in the, in the person and work of the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, was always with God's people. He was there at creation. He's there with kings and with judges and with particular individuals at certain times. He's there with, abiding with the nation, leading them in all manner of ways. The Holy Spirit was said to be with God's people, but Jesus on one occasion told his disciples that something else is going to happen. In fact, Jesus says it's important and it's necessary that I go away from you so that the Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter can come. And when he comes, he will not just be with you. That's already been the case. Guiding you where you should go, being with you, protecting you in ways that you don't see and, and, and guiding the people, the faithful of Israel. But Jesus said, not only is he going to be with you, he's going to be in you. This is new in the New Covenant. This is new as we see it unfolded in the New Testament, the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 is, is a key passage on that. But he tells us here that, that this is a man who's not just uh, uh, who's righteous before God and devout of heart, but the Holy Spirit is guiding him. And how so? We see a particular of this in verse 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. We don't have the particulars here, but special revelation is given to Simeon for not only the benefit of Simeon, but for our benefit as well. Here we are reading about it. Here it is given by Luke to his dear friend to bolster his faith. It had been revealed to him that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Most surmise from this and a couple of other details here that this man is, is uh, advanced in years meaning he has been waiting all of his life for the consolation of Israel, for God to fulfill the promises. He's been looking forward to this time. He says at the end that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Christ, that, that name is a title. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a translation of Messiah, the anointed one. This is the Lord's Messiah, that he would not die, he would not depart this earth until he had seen the Messiah for himself. Little did he know what would happen next. Uh, that could have been, the promise could have been that he would see him from a distance. The, the, the promise could have been that he would pass by in a crowd and he would see him, he would get a glimpse and he would be able to go home and tell his wife, I've seen the Messiah. He would be able to tell his children and grandchildren, I've seen the Messiah, I can die. What he didn't understand and what was revealed to him and now has come to fruition, verse 27 he came in the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for the custom of the law, they, they put baby Jesus into the hands of this man, Simeon. And he's holding him there. He's holding 
literally, the comfort of Israel. He's holding here the hope for all mankind. He's holding in his hands Jesus, the Messiah. Sound familiar? We, we sing this. We, we look forward to this. And here is a man who is holding the consolation, the comfort of Israel. The only comfort that could come in life and in death is embodied perfectly and righteously and wonderfully in the infant flesh of Jesus. What brings you comfort? What brings you comfort? I love Christmas because we have an opportunity to really accentuate that every year. Obviously, as believers, we say this all the time, that this is true for us, not just at Christmas, it's true for us every day, but, but to put some, uh, some finer points on this once a year and to accentuate this wonderful truth, what brings you comfort? What brings you comfort in a very difficult year? What brings you comfort in the face of tremendous loss? What brings you comfort in an unsteady market, in job situations, and housing, and all of those things? What is it that brings you, you comfort? Am I comforted? Am I comforted with the consolation of Israel? That God and all of those promises, when you're reading through the Old Testament, and, and I know that most of you are going to start again in January, Right? When you start reading through and you get bogged down and you say, where is this going? This is where it's going. It's all running to Christ. We sing this, don't we? About the consolation of Israel coming to us, being revealed to us and for us. O come, O come, Emmanuel, ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appears. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. There is no rest unless we rest in Christ. There is no rest from our anxieties. There is no rest from our troubles. Those things will continue. But there is comfort in Christ. Have you thought about this, that Simeon walked out of the temple that day and likely walked into all sorts of situations. Some of them we know, some of them we don't. We don't know what his home life was. We don't know what his marriage was like. We don't know where his kids were and any troubles and grandchildren and the things that had been brought to, to his household. We don't, we don't know the pressures that he was under as a representative in the temple living under Roman uh, uh, authority and rule. He walked right back into those same situations and many others that we, we could only possibly guess at. And yet he found comfort in the only source of comfort, and it is knowing that God actually fulfills his promises, that God has done so. Another question that we need to ask before we leave, am I at peace? Am I at peace? Like Simeon, there, we can guess there may not be peace in the home, there may not be peace in the culture, and in the neighborhood, and in the job situation, and in any manner of things. But am I at peace? Verse 28, he took Jesus into his arms, and he blessed God. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, and he's just talking to the Lord. Now, Lord Yahweh, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. We said last week, Mary's song, these are the songs of Christmas. Hers is in Latin referred to as the Magnificat because her soul magnifies the Lord. This song by Simeon, and it's given in, in poetic uh, musical uh, meter here. It, it, it's it's uh, traditionally known as the Nuke Dementis uh, from the Latin, Greek to Latin to English, uh, now release or now dismiss. We would say that in our common tongue, I can die now. That's what he's saying. I can die now. I've seen it all. I've seen all the promises of God. I've seen what I have longed for. I've seen what I have been devoted to. I can die now. Notice a couple of features about his peace. This is not just a peace for peace's sake. 
that this peace must be grounded in truth. He says there in verse 29, according to your word. I've seen his word fulfilled, Simeon says. Uh, Theophilus, Luke's friend, this is how you can know for certain because men and women have come before us. They have seen the word fulfilled. And I am, Luke says, I'm putting the details of this down in writing so that your faith will be bolstered so that you will know what is taking place. This is not just Simeon got some warm fuzzies. This is Simeon was led by the Spirit of God to trust his word. By the way, that is always what the Spirit of God will do. The Spirit of God will not lead you away from the Bible. The Spirit of God will not contradict what is said in Scripture. The Spirit of God will not lead us to think and say and do something that is opposed to what God has revealed by His Spirit. The Spirit never thinks or speaks with a forked tongue. He doesn't say one thing and then we go to Scripture and we find something else. The Spirit will also not lead us to misuse Scripture and take verses out of context. None of those things have anything to do with the Spirit. The Spirit of God always, always, perfectly points to Christ. If there's any misunderstanding of that, it's not on the side of the Spirit. It's on the side of frail, sinful, fallen humanity. Because we get warm fuzzies. And we... we look at things and we try to read signs and clouds and things that are happening in the, in the world. Could this be happening? Could this be shaping up? None of which are told to us. What's told to us is what we see demonstrated and where should we be? It is taking God at His word. According to your word. According to your word. Do not put your life in the hands of any promise that is not grounded in truth. Ever. It's grounded in truth. That's a true peace, by the way, because that can change with circumstances. Circumstances come and go, good ones, favorable ones, hardships, difficulties. But when your life is tethered to the Word of God, when your life is moored to, to that, you can stand in the midst of all those things, friends. What's a, how else is this peace evidence? It's evidence in the fact that he's grounded in the truth, but it's also evidenced in salvation, verses 30 and 30 through 32. He says, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Now, now note, that's the, that's the centerpiece of this little section, salvation. And then he says, then he describes it, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. And then he details that in verse 32 in a couple of ways. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The centerpiece of this is salvation. Simeon has not tied his boat to any dock other than the fact that God and God alone saves humanity and saves him. He has no other hope, no other trust, no other peace. It is in salvation. And he spells this out. This salvation has been prepared. It has been, it has been uh, foreseen. It has been at work in redemptive history. And now it is manifest. It is seen in the presence of all peoples. This salvation that has been anticipated and, and promised has now manifested. It is now born out fully in the person and work of this baby Jesus, who will grow into the, the man Jesus. What is the salvation? He says two things about it. He says, it is a light of revelation to the Gentiles. A light of revelation to the Gentiles. Some have mistaken. Isaiah 42 is where this is uh, mentioned, by the way. Isaiah 42, verse 6. Uh, it doesn't say that Israel is a light to the nations. It actually says that the servant himself, the Messiah that would come, is the light to the nations. Israel is just to point everyone to the light. That was their job. That was their role, to draw the nations to them and draw them so that they would see the light, the Messiah. And they failed miserably in that job description. But this Messiah who is to come, he is a light of revelation to the Gentiles. They are in darkness. That's how Gentiles in the Old and New Testament are often pictured. We've seen that already in, in uh, Romans. See that all throughout Isaiah. Gentiles are in darkness. Part of what that means is that God did not come to them first with his covenants and his promises. He came to Abraham and he built a nation through Abraham. 
And then that nation would become Israel, and that nation would be a blessing to all the other nations, and all the nations would then have the light of the Messiah. And so this Messiah that he holds in his hands is a light of revelation to the Gentiles. No Gentile, no Greek, is just going to naturally figure this out. No one is just going to naturally put the pieces together and and understand salvation. But this is revealed, and it's revealed, as we've said, through the Word of God. It's revealed in the person and work of Christ. This salvation is revelation to the Gentiles. But notice also at the end of verse 32, it is the glory of your people Israel. The glory of your people Israel. You have to know this, and, and you do if you're familiar at all with the Old Testament leading up to this point. Israel's history has been anything but glory. You know what it's been marked by? Shame. It has been shameful episode after shameful episode. Just start right there at Genesis 3. As soon as sin comes into the garden, it's never the same. In fact, they they cover themselves with leaves because of their shame. They do horrible things to one another all throughout Genesis ghastly, sinful, ungodly, wicked, evil things to one another. Then they export their evil, and they do it upon other nations. And then other nations import that evil back to them, and they do it back on Israel. And it's just this cycle of evil and wickedness and shame, this nation that was to be a light to all the other nations, and to say, here is the Messiah, come and know him, come and worship him, and enjoy his kingdom. Instead, it's just episode after episode of shame. Carried off into exile. Maybe a short reprieve. They get to go back and it's never the same. The walls are never quite right. The buildings never seem to be the way they once were. And it's never the same. And by the way, to this very day, it's never the same. And yet what Simeon holds in his arms, this little baby, he says, is the glory of of your people Israel. The glory revealed, the glory restored, the the wondrous work of God is now seen and, and held even. No longer their shame, but now glory has shown. We read this morning, the glory shown all about them. The name of the Lord is magnified in what he is accomplishing. The the work of the Lord is going to be seen in this little Messiah that he holds in his arms. Are you at peace? Do you have peace? There is no peace apart from this wonderful truth. That peace is found exclusively and only in Christ Jesus. That will be a peace that will be grounded in truth and that will be a peace that will be evidenced in salvation as you believe the truth about this Jesus. One final question there at the very end, am I divided? Am I divided? The the story takes a a very interesting and and strange turn and tone. The the mood shifts. We we go from this this bright, shining, glorious scene where this this newborn infant is held and and celebrated and and worshipped over and God is thanked to a dark cloud that begins to invade at this point. Verse 33, his father and mother, it's Mary and Joseph, they're, they're amazed at the things which were being said about Jesus. I mean, can you imagine... The answer to that is no. None of us can really imagine what is this, the emotions and the the back and forth that is going on in their own hearts. They're just amazed at this, just stunned. And Simeon, verse 34, he blessed them. And then he speaks to Mary. He turns his sight on Mary. He says this in verse 34, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. 
We didn't see that coming. We didn't, you know, we joke about this. Um, someone has a baby, and for the most part, people rejoice, and they bring gifts, and they bring food, keep it coming, that's wonderful. All those things are happening, but there's always that one person, right? Oh yeah, what a, what a blessing, but, and they tell new parents this, they have a habit of telling new parents this, it's terrible. You're never gonna sleep again. Your life's never gonna be the same. Uh, you know, all these, all these terrible things, and they, and they begin to unpack, and they're the bearers of bad news, and they're, they're the negative Nancys that come in, and they're just, they're just telling and dropping everything. No offense to any Nancys. Uh, they're, they're dropping just, just horrible things on the person. It seems like Simeon is doing that here. What a blessing that little child is. Praise God for that. By the way, Mary, <laughs> bad news. Actually, he's, if you can see it, he's, I think he's actually comforting Mary because she's aware of some of this. She knows what the promises of God are. See, last week, she knows what has been promised. She knows that the, the, the Messiah will suffer for the people. She knows that Zechariah said he will be pierced through his hands. She knows those promises. What would be the tendency of any parent so that's a mother in such a situation, is to maybe question, is this really the plan of God? <laughs> is there another way? As he seemingly gets lost in the temple, as he begins to enthrall the teachers and we start to see something different about him as he grows in wisdom and stature, is there another way? Because I know that the path ahead of us is going to be full of pain and, and questions. But notice what Simeon says here. Here's where I think the encouragement is. Look at it very carefully in verse 34. Behold, this child is what? Is appointed. Is appointed. This is not happenstance. This is not an accident. Christ has come on the scene for this reason. And what you need to understand, Mary, and what everybody needs to understand is that not everyone responds the same way. He is appointed for the fall of and the rise of many in Israel. Uh, the fall might have in mind here the, the fact that Jesus the Messiah, coming from lowly origins, coming from the, the other side of the tracks, coming not from what everybody expected the king of Israel should, should be like and look like. You know what that's going to amount to in Israel? It's going to amount to this, that he will be a stumbling block to the majority in Israel. It will be only a small remnant who will believe and Confess that he is the Messiah. 1 Corinthians 1, 23, Paul says to the Jew, he is a stumbling block. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter 2, 8. It will be for the fall of many, not only to Israel, but also even to Greeks and Gentiles. He is, a, a, he is, he is someone who is opposed. He's someone who is not believed. He is a stumbling block of different sorts. He is a, a mark of foolishness to the Greeks. But he also says there, the fall and the rise of many. It's kind of interesting that, that every other usage of this word in the New Testament always refers to resurrection. Not only will many people stumble over the truth, not only will people stumble over their only comfort, source of comfort and peace in this world, but many others will believe. And they will be accounted with Christ. And they will be raised up with him. In fact, that's the language Paul uses, Ephesians 2, 6, that we have been raised up with Christ, even though looking around, we have not been raised up yet, right? We are so identified with Christ that his death and resurrection is a first fruits of what will take place for every true believer in the future. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that it's a first fruits of our resurrection. And he says, and Luke says here, that he is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. The word opposed there is, is literally anti-word, uh, anti-lego. It is, it is a word that means to speak against, to contradict. You want to test that out? Just mention Jesus in any mixed company. It, it mention him at work. We just sang this morning, you all sang out wonderfully that he is the only hope for mankind. Try that at work. 
Try that on the college campus. He is a sign to be opposed. You need to understand that, that believing in Christ will not always be accepted and received with joy. And then finally, he says in verse 35, Mary, even a sword will pierce your own soul. This is not a small dagger in, in Rome and Israel at that time. They, they, they had the Second Amendment of Israel and they believed in concealed carry. And the average daily um, uh, concealed carry was a little dagger that they would carry along with them because there were robbers along the, the roads and all kinds of things. And, and, and that was what was typically carried. That's not the word that he uses here. The word that he uses for sword in verse 35, this is a large, heavy instrument of war. You can actually recover from a dagger. You don't recover from this. This, this, is, this is so hard, you're never quite the same. It will pierce your soul, Mary. Why to this end? Why does it have to be this way? Why has God appointed it to be such? To the end that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Jesus shows and reveals where hearts really are before God. The deepest seat of thought. There's, there's a paradoxical nature happening all throughout this text. You have on the one hand... The fact that Jesus is the light, He's the Messiah, He is the glory, He is salvation, He is the hope, He is all of these things here. And at the same time, you have opposition, you have judgment that is there, you have hard-heartedness of those who would turn against the Lord. Are you divided? Where do you stand before the Lord? For the believer, you stand under the blood of Christ and in the righteousness of Christ. Your hope is not in yourself. Your hope is in Christ, like Simeon. There's a great prayer in the, in the Puritan prayer book, The Valley of Vision. And just one line from that that caught my attention. It says, Let me with Simeon clasp the newborn child to my heart, embrace him with undying faith, exulting that he is mine and I am his. I can promise you nothing else beyond that this morning from God's word. And you can only know that by faith. Do you know this, this Lord? Do you know this Savior? Do you know this Messiah? If so, you can say that He is mine and I am His. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank You for Your Word and we pray that You would strengthen our hearts with it. Lord, I pray that You would build up Your church as there is so much anxiety and doubt and trouble, all of the things that you warned us about, all things that you said would happen, you said in this world we will have trouble, but take heart because you have overcome the world. And you've overcome the power of sin in the work of your cross. You have overcome its hold and its sway over our life so that we are now freed from its domain and now we are in Christ. We are in you. We have union with you because of what you have done for us. And so we are no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to Christ. We thank you for the testimony of Simeon. We thank you for the testimony of and the difficult words that Mary and Joseph received on that day, and yet their difficult words and their hard experience was salvation for us. We who were far from the promises and the covenants of God. Your light has shown, and it has shown in Christ Jesus. I pray, Lord, at this Christmas season that the light that has shown in our hearts will be full and expressed with our words, with our singing, with our lives before men as we are called to give an account for the hope that is within us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen indeed. Let's stand together and sing with one voice. Let us find our rest in Thee. and 
announcements before we stand and do the benediction together. Uh, one is the youth Christmas party is this evening from 5 to 8. If you have any questions, please come see me about that. The other is women's leadership training that will begin again in January. It's going to be on the third Sunday of every month, just like the men's. There's going to be an email with more details about that, so be on the lookout for that. If you have any questions or would like to sign up until then, see Matt Hammonds. All right. Let's stand for the benediction, please. It's going to be from Jeremiah 32:40, and we'll say it together. I will make an everlasting covenant with them, turn away from them to you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>